All right, my dear sunnies, I heard you guys since the publishing day of the video who Jack the Ripper might be. Let me tell you the amount of comments and some arguments in the comments were actually pretty funny. May I remind you guys to actually have a discussion and not a contest on who's right without any evidence to back it up. Anyway, since posting my previous video, I've received 30 likes, 8 dislikes. So far, this is my most ratio dislike video, which is fair because there were several problems with the video such as speech, some parts not making sense, or information that got a bit unclear. I really do appreciate that everyone pointed this out, and now hopefully I'm making a better and more accurate video. Now, onwards to Jack the Ripper and his most popular identities, according to me. <laughs> At number one, we'll start with George Chapman. The primary reason that George is considered a suspect in Jack the Ripper's killings, according to jackripper.co.uk, is based on this prior experience as a serial killer. His mode of operandi is strikingly different than the author of Whitechapel Murders, however, as George chose to poison his victims with tartar anemic, Jack the Ripper was more violent, deciding to grotesquely mutilate his victims after killing them. The London media speculated about his possible connection with the Whitechapel murders after his execution, but most experts find it unlikely. George did live in the Whitechapel area during the time of the murder, but so did many other more likely suspects. We can get more information about this from the site RebeccaFrostWrites.com, where they state that George Chapman murdered his mistress by poisoning them with tartar emetic. He had a syringe of relationships with women who presented themselves as his wife, and while some of them left Chapman because he was violent, Three of them died because of him. Chapman's first known murder was Mary Isabella Spink in 1897, his second, Bessie Taylor in 1901, and his third, Maud Marsh in 1902. Reports at the trial indicate that he was physically abusive to all three, as well as the other woman, some mothers of his children, who left him perhaps before he could murder them as well. Suspicions were high enough after Marsh's death for the bodies of Spink and Taylor to be exhumed as well in order to prove poisoning. Chapman was charged with Marsh's murder, brought to trial, convicted on March 19, 1903, and hanged on April 7th with his motive still unproven. Although he inherited a legacy from Spink, there's no monetary reason for him to have murdered Taylor and Marsh. No less than Frederick Alberline himself considered George Chapman to have been Jack the Ripper. When he spoke to the policeman who arrested Chapman, he's reported to have said, You've got Jack the Ripper at last. During the initial investigation, Aberline had interviewed Chapman's wife at the time, who apparently reported that he was out and about at all hours. However, Chapman, who was then going by Swerven Kolowski, was not named as a suspect in 1888. It was only his arrest for serial poisoning that put his name on the shortlist. Experts remain divided whether Chapman should be regarded as a serious ripper suspect. Some point to the fact that Chapman's violent streak and cruelty to women were well documented. At number two, we have Walter Sicker. While researching the man, it is my opinion that Walter is actually the weakest link to the Jack the Ripper case. Articles mention impotency as a possible modus operandi that could be linked to why he hated women so much, but reports say he was anything but impotent and that his wife divorced him because he cheated. So, popular opinion for investigator was that Walter had used the hatred of being lied about for the fact that the woman had essentially used his possible impotency against him. He in turn made all of his anger known to women connected to the Whitechapel murders. Artshelp.net states that Sicker was known to boast about renting a studio once occupied by Jack the Ripper and painted a series called The Camden Town Murders while staying there. The Camden Town Murder, which closely resembles the modus operandi of Jack the Ripper, was committed during the time Sicker worked in the supposed Ripper studio. That part becomes muddy in connecting Sicker to the crime is because multiple family members who referred to him in the letters as vacationing with them in France during the time of the murders in Whitechapel. Police do suspect him of writing the letters and do not believe that the killer himself wrote those letters. In my personal opinion, I feel like Sicker was a copycat of Jack. Just because he wanted the notoriety and the fact that he had painted such disturbing pictures that were so heavily reflected on what Jack the Ripper did to his victims. Another thing to note is that according to Tate.org.uk, Sicker's paintings are not illustrated of the event. One might nonetheless compare them with the description images that are or claim to be. This helps throw into relief the kinds of pictorial choices that Sickert made and reconstructed something of the noise of urban reportage, audible and popular memory, against which they figured, as in the double page spreaded from the Illustrated Police News and Illustrated Police Budget. And Sickert was already fascinated by Jack the Ripper. Oxford Sitwell recalled his talk contained certain variable strands, certain immutable moments, chief among them the Tichborne Clement and Jack the Ripper, Marjorie Lilly knew him that he worked on the murder paintings and also noted his obsession with crime personified by Jack the Ripper. In fact, one of his paintings titled What Shall We Do For Rent is most likely parodied with Jack the Ripper's first victims when her last words were, I shan't be long getting my bed money, look at my smart bonnet. 
I have more information down below in the um, description box if you are more interested in reading it yourself. But the issue is that that's as far as I got with it. There wasn't anything else that really linked him to it. So that's why I believe he personally was a copycat of Jack. And he just wanted more notoriety and fame so that um, his paintings would probably sell better. At number three, we have Charles Lechmere. You know the saying, a rose is a rose by any other name? Well, consider Charles a killer by any other name is still a killer. The detail of Charles' involvement with the murders is fairly straightforward. According to casebook.org, he lived at 22 Devonton Street, Bethel Green, and worked as a carman or cart driver for the Pickfords. On the morning of the 31st August of 1888, he was walking through Bucks Row on his way to Pickford's Depot in Broad Street when he found the body of Polly Nichols. An important note is that the British census would sometimes confuse the last names Cross with Crass. Young Charles' mother chose a policeman by the name of Thomas Cross after his biological father died. Not surprisingly, the young boy was encouraged enough to go under the new family surname, and on 1861 census, he was registered by his stepfather as Charles Cross. The only time he appeared on any census as Cross, for every other census he appeared under his real name of Lechmere. An interesting thing is that when Charles discovered the body of Polly, he told police his name was Charles Cross instead of using Lechmere's surname that he was so comfortable and even preferred using. Now back to finding Polly's body. First, Charles lied about his name. Second, he lied about being sent to get help. When Charles finds her body, he is described as standing in the middle of the road. Then suddenly, Robert Paul walked over and Charles called him over. According to, to a secret step.co.uk, both conversed and even touched her body, noting it still felt warm. Um, the, they touched her face, not like legs or anything else, just in case that's something important for you guys. They both went and got a nearby police officer. Police officer Meisen both stated that they found a drunk woman laying down on Buck's Row. While the officer lets them go on their merry way, not thinking anything was serious, unfortunately, the officer felt nothing was suspicious, and both were noted to be playing down the injuries that Polly suffered. Now, some reports did suggest because it was so late at night, um, they were not able to see the extensivity of her wounds and the fact that her throat was slashed. Now, uh, the reason why they th also think Charles could have done it was because his route to work passed right through the killing fields of Jack the Ripper. During those fatal few months, he was in the neighborhood practically every day. He was almost certainly in close proximity of the murders of Martha Tabron, Polly Nichols, obviously, and Annie Chapman. He knew the area extremely well. He, he would have been a face considered by the local working girls as getting on a bit, no real threat. Most critically, he was the first on the scene of Polly's murder. By modern police standards, that would place him under suspicion at the very least. Regarding whether he was standing over the body, as Paul said, or in the middle of the street, as he himself claimed, in fact, the discrepancy would be enough for today's police to take him into further questioning. Clearly, they failed to mention this to PC Misen. It was a detail that only came out at Polly's inquest. They told Misen that they had been sent by another constable to get help. That was not true. Although when PC Myson got to Bucks Row, PC John Neal, who had stumbled across Polly, and PC Tain were already in attendance. Myson wasn't known they had discovered Polly independently. PC Tain went to fetch Dr. Lewin, who was on the scene around 3.50 a.m. He pronounced Polly had been dead, but a few minutes. This was only 10 minutes after Lechmere claims to have found her, and only 5 after he and Paul left together to seek assistance. If Lechmere was Jack the Ripper, he did a remarkable job of hiding the fact right up until his death in 1920. If he wasn't Jack, he could have only been seconds behind the killer in Buck's Row on the night that Polly Nichols died. Yet, he saw nobody, heard nothing, smelt nothing, and noticed absolutely nothing out of place. This right here is the most, um, this right here is the main reason why people feel that Charles is for sure the killer, because everything seemed way too coincidental um, to actually be coincidental. You know what I mean? Like everything fell into place a little too nicely for him. And then finally, we got number four, Aaron Kosminski. Aaron is a Polish-born immigrant. Records are not clear when he arrived to the U.S., but estimation is between 1880 to 1881. Interesting enough, out of all these suspects, scientists believe they have the most evidence against Aaron. The results come from a forensic examination of a stained silk shawl that investigators said was found next to the mutilated body of Catherine Eddowes, the killer's fourth victim in 1888. The shawl is speckled with what is claimed to be blood and semen, the latter believed to be from the killer. According to Science.org, the first genetic test on the shawl samples were conducted several years ago by Jari Lohelain, a biochemist at Liverpool John Moores University in the United Kingdom, but he said he wanted to wait for the fuss to die down before he submitted the results. 
Arthur Russell Edwards, who brought the shawl in 2007, gave it to Jari. He used the unpublished results of the test to identify Kosminski as the murderer in a 2014 book called Naming Jack the Ripper. But geneticists complained at this time that it was impossible to access the claims because few technical details about the analysis of the genetic sample from the shell were available. Therefore, no conclusive results could be given. Another issue is the key details on the specific genetic variants identified and compared between DNA samples are not included in the paper. Instead, the authors represent them in a graph with series of colored boxes where the boxes overlap. They say the shawl and the modern DNA sequences match. Now let's take a step back to the how and why Aaron was suspected as Jack the Ripper. Casebook.org and JackTheRipper.org corroborate the following. He worked as a hairdresser in Whitechapel at the East End of London where a series of murders ascribed to identif- unidentified figure nicknamed Jack the Ripper were committed in 1888. From 1891, Aaron was institutionalized after he threatened his sister with a knife. He was first held at Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum and then transferred to Leavesden Asylum. Police officials from the time of the murder named one of their suspects as Kalminski. The forename was not given and described him as a Polish Jew in an insane asylum. Almost a century after the final murder, the suspect Kalminski was identified as Aaron Kalminski. But there was little evidence to connect him with the Kalminski who was suspected of the murders and their dates of death are different. Possibly Kalminski was possibly confused with another Polish Jew of the same age named Aaron or David Goham. Real name possibly Nathan Kalminski who was a violent patient at the Coldly Hatch Asylum. There's nothing else that I could find in terms of evidence. Um, as I went through a lot of articles, essentially it, him being like living near those areas and then him being admitted to a asylum for violence is the reason why they even brought him as a suspect. Um, I kind of find it a little distressing that the police never added like their surname on there. Usually when you bring someone in for questioning, you're going to have the first and last name. So I feel like when it comes to the Jack the Ripper case, maybe this is me being too harsh on the police, but I feel like questions weren't asked properly, which is why a lot of things went through the cracks. You know what I mean? So, um, for example, when it comes to um, the one that I read about for Charles, I feel like you should have kept the suspect with you and brought the suspect with you to the scene. And then from there, question them. Not like the suspect comes to you, tells you what happens, and then they're on their merry way. You know? Well, there it is, everyone. Jack the Ripper's most popular identities to me. The case remains open till this day, and no one has been officially charged for the murders. I hope everyone enjoyed this video. Please let me know your thoughts regarding this topic down below. Please also include any inf- new information that I possibly missed. I hope I did much better on this one as I went through many, many articles. I did my best to condense it so it would be straight to the point. Um, the links to all the research that I did will be down below. I'm going to put the um, suspect's name and then just the links to it just to make it a little easier. I really hope, (laughs) I really, really hope that this time it was a lot better for you guys and everything made more sense. Yes, I did proofread it, so I proofread it. I had a robot read it to me, so in my mind everything sounds right, so I hope everything sounds right to you guys too. As always, thank you for your patience and thanks Thanks for coming with me on this journey. Stay sunny.